Ini wikato na mihi ke koto i rangatira ma New Frontiers tina koto iti iwi tone tina koto tina ra tina koto katoa. Um, I'm just rapt to be here. I've been to every New Frontiers. Um, what I like about you is your paradigm to challenge what we do. Is I prefer to be introduced as Tumuaki rather than Director General. Um, and and really the thoughts that you give to us about how we save this pressure, Fenua and Awa come from some of the energy in the room. And every time I come here, I get new ideas. So I'm going to take you through the story of our nature. I grew up on the West Coast. I've grown up in nature. I ran the New Zealand Antarctic Program for 11 years, so I really got immersed deeply in climate change research, helped set up to Papadafai, and for five years I've been running it. So the New Zealand story is about open spaces, open hearts, open minds, and what we say at Te Papa Arifai is we're a critical part of the story. We can't grow our primary industries without protecting nature. And with Prime Minister Ardern, we have a person who is saying we have to switch from the well-being of people and the environment to grow the economy. So it's a complete dichotomy to what we've previously had. And, you know, we've got 181 million of new money based on that scenario, is we cannot continue to damage our environment and we're going to grow our economy off this environment. And in the words of Tamati Kruger from, from Tuhoi, nature owns us, we don't own it. And if we, we nurture nature, we, we, we live good lives. But the minute we think we own nature, we're in trouble. So, you know, I don't want to take anything away from Coupe's amazing discovery of Aotearoa and, and those, those, joy, those voyages of those giant waka coming through the Pacific. But I want to give you some understanding of why New Zealand has so much of its biodiversity in trouble and why it's such a, such a, 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 a privilege to try and address this. So last year we had this ship, the Joydes Resolution, uh, coming around New Zealand and, and drilling at the edge of these plates to, to, to nail the hypothesis, is, is Zealandia a continent? And what we've found from that is that shape going right up to New Caledonia is actually an ancient continent that actually came out of Australia, Antarctica and New Guinea. And that's why when you go to New Caledonia, you go to the west coast of New Caledonia, it virtually feels like Kaikoura. They've got the Kadu, we've got the uh, Kiwi, we've got so many, you know, they've got so many ferns there. So what's happened is, is this continent has, has come above the ocean and sunk below it and come up again. And then plate tectonics, the, uh, the Australian plate crashing into the, into the uh, Pacific plate, have led to this fastest growing place on the earth as it comes up into the southern Alps but also erodes in one of the most geologically unstable places on the planet. So I call it ancient antiquity in terms of, of um, this, this incredible place that grew up without mammals. So these land bridges all broke apart, and we are a land of birds. So our highest order is birds. Tuatara, 80 million years old. They are prehistoric reptile. Hochstetter's frog... Uh, communicate through chemical secretions. The kiwi was an ancient bird that came out of Antarctica. It's the only one that's uh, the giant uh, elephant bird of Madagascar is the nearest lineage to the kiwi. And we've got a bird in the, in the South America called the tenemu. So this was a bird that was able to fly here and in the absence of mammals grew to this flightless nature. The cowrie forests were, were in, in Antarctica. We now know through through some of the fossil records that Kauri was the dominant species in Antarctica. And the, the little rifleman there, or Titiponamu, is the ancient lineage of all the wrens in the world, and the Mohua is the ancient lineage of all the canaries in the world. So that's how special this place is. And then we had this, this gigantism, these moas, and the uh, Haas eagle came into New Zealand about a million years ago. It uh, flew in from Australia and developed into this massive bird, the largest eagle on the planet, and, and put, forced many of our birds into a nocturnal habitat because it went round plucking kakapo like they were magnum ice creams. Um, but you, if you can imagine a bird with talons as big as a leopard, that's what the Haas eagle was. So, so it's an incredible biodiversity ha we have. Uh, Māori came here 900 years and had a concept of rahui and knew how to live with nature, Pākehā arrived from Cook in, in 1795 onwards 
and, and, and proceeded to decimate this place as we brought in rats, cats, possums, stoats. And in 1826, we tried to start a fur industry. So, so as we were co as Europeans were colonising this place, they were trying to create a little Britain. So in Greytown, not far from here, we had the first inland town where um, the Ridifords, who were close friends of Queen Victoria, were able to get the best deer in the world from, from the Hyde Park herd. We had foxes, we had badgers, you know. Every, we were actually really trying to recreate how we lived in Britain. Then we brought in the possums from Australia. We wanted a fur industry. In 1826, we didn't get them going, so we brought them back in 1836 and got them really going. Um, and then we brought in rabbits because uh, fur was, was a big thing in China and we could have an export industry of uh, rabbit fur, released them at Port Chalmers, released them out at Greytown, released them in Bluff near Invercargill, and they slowly decimated the landscapes until they overtook the pioneering farmers. So then our, next, our first conservation debate was in 1880, and this is the time that Rudyard Kipling wrote this poem called The Cities, and this was about Auckland, which he described as the last, loneliest, loveliest, ex exquisite. So at that time, Auckland would have been teeming with Kiwi, with Kokako, with Hihi, with Tui, with Bellbird. And in 1880, because the farmers were being decimated by rabbits, we had a debate in Parliament about whether we bring in mustelids, roats, stoats and ferrets. And the scientific community in New Zealand, remember the treaty partners pretty much um, being quietened in this whole debate, and it becomes a debate between the farmers and the science community in New Zealand, the scientists pleaded with the government not to bring in stoats. And the farming community won out and we started to bring in stoats in their hundreds and thousands. And we started breeding them and releasing them and we released uh, Alexandra to, to, to kill off the, the rabbits and within four years they'd got into Dusky Sound and Richard Henry, the first conservation ranger in the world, whose job was to, to row kakapo and... Uh, and Kiwi onto Resolution Island and the first conservation reserves in New Zealand, Resolution Island, Kapiti Island and, and Hauturu in the, in the Gulf, all because of this debate about uh, what we're going to do about stoats. We protected stoats for about uh, 15 years. And then the new government came in in 1900 and said, we're going to make this the world's greatest game reserve. So we brought in moose and chamois and tar and deer and, you know, so... So you can see what was happening against this, this, this ancient antiquity and these birds and animals that just didn't know how to cope with all these uh, animals that we were introducing. In one place in New Zealand, in, in Tapaki, in, in the far north, in Tehiku, um, you can put out your arm and there's 50 species of snails. So that's incredible biodiversity. The only thing that matches that is parts of New Guinea and Costa Rica. So what we're saying is our nature is central to our national identity. We grow up in nature. We grow up possuming, we grow up kayaking, we grow up um, in these wonderful environments. And the environment we grow up in Haast is quite different to the environment we grow up in Kaitaia. But we are people of the land. And unlike many other countries, our, our whole um, DNA comes from nature. We wake up every morning to the, to the uh, dawn, the bird call on Radio New Zealand, it's in our money, our war dead sit under the uh, silver fern, it is part of who we are as a nature. So we, we, in using the term our nature, we're saying Doc doesn't own this. This is, this is with our treaty partner, this is your nature. So we, we've found it's been too much. Doc thinks it's precious, this is how you act. We're saying it's yours. Uh, and for 80 million years, we've grown up in this exceptional place and we have a strong connection. So we'll only fix it when we engage our hearts and minds. We cannot do it alone. We cannot do it. We're doing it with Treaty Partner. We're doing it with NGOs. We're doing it with Next Foundation. Great to see Bill Commode here and that 100 million that uh, Next Foundation is putting into environment and education. Just a huge uh, vote of confidence in what, what we're doing with nature and, and youth. And we're doing it with our Treaty Partner. And unlike most government agencies, we have a unique relationship to our treaty partner because this is their ancestral lands, this is their whenua, their awa. Their awa. And if you can get um, a, a, a future of conservation with treaty partner, it's a slam dunk when you come into a debate 
with fishers or farmers or NGOs, if you're linked at the hip with Treaty Partner, now I don't say we're always the best, but we really aim to be linked at the hip with our Treaty Partner in advancing how we manage these special lands of New Zealand. Because it is, it, it, it's, a, it's a slam dunk in terms of policy, every other thing we do when we're linked with our Treaty Partner, and it's a unique part of, of my job as Director General. So this, um, this um, if the land is well, the sea is well, the people will thrive, that was Māori's philosophy in terms of New Zealand, is how to live with nature in New Zealand. And that's really where we've got to get back to. So our purpose is to work with others to increase the value of conservation for New Zealanders. So we, it's signalling we cannot do it alone. So we've got three things we've really got to do. Number one is, um, is reversing New Zealand's biodiversity decline. We have to do it. There's a call to arms. It's a burning platform. We're seeing a record increase in tourism. All the sites we see now are going to have another million by 2025. And in some parts of New Zealand, we are struggling with social licence. We're struggling with camper vans. And many of our parks are heading to a million. And we have to enable our treaty partner in terms of how we manage whenua and awa. So those are the things that get me out of bed, is, is how we do this. And this is the plan, is what I'm working on at the moment. So 50% of New Zealand's natural ecosystems are benefiting from pest management. And we now know that stoats, rats and possums are, are primary enemies number one. So we set up Predator Free. We've done a lot of work with Next Foundation on zero invasive predators. How do we actually clear areas of pests and then keep them clear without having to use more 1080 and without having to put in fences? Um, so we've got 2,000 communities in Auckland. We've got 16,000 people in, Christ in, in Wellington City aiming for Predator Free. Wilding Pines, there's a, just behind Hamner, 2014-2017. We're putting 16 million in to try and... Wilding Pines will take New Zealand over if we don't do something about it. We're going for 100 million in this budget. New Zealand will start to look like Aspen and Colorado, and is that what we want? And Mackenzie will be taken over by Wilding Pines as climate change kicks in, and you can see that just in five years. Myrtle rust blew in here last, uh, three years ago from, Tarrant, from Australia into Taranaki. So as fast as we work on pests, we've got new ones coming in. And Kari Dieback is an absolute... Uh, I know the previous minister said, if Tane Mahuta dies, you lose your job. You know, that's, that is such a symbol to New Zealand of our spirituality and connection with nature, Tane Mahuta. 90% of our threatened species are managed to enhance their populations. So we're doing well with Kākāpō. We've got the, um, the, um, the semen drone, flying semen across uh, Whenua Ho and, and getting that semen to the females as quick as we can. Um, we <laughs> because they, these boys are too slow to get. <laughs> so we, we got some real breakthrough technology in getting every egg to have, a, to have a chick. So we'll push through 200 kākāpō, which is remarkable for a bird that went down to 70 birds. Takahi, we're go going through 300. We've introduced the first wild population with Naitahu into the Hifi track. Kōkāko, we've now got self-sustaining populations. And Taiko, the world's rarest petrel, 26 chicks born last year. But we're still in trouble. Antivity wandering albatross, 50% decline since 2005. These birds are getting hit in the long-line fishery off the Humboldt Current off Chile. So we're going to have to work internationally on this. The airwell ground beetle, probably extinct this year. Um, the fairy tern, around about 60 60 pairs on the beaches of Walkworth and Matakana, where we have some of our highest population density. And Rata, Rata Moha, Bartlett's Rata in the far north, only eight trees. And if, if, if uh, myrtle rust gets in that, we lose them. Uh, 50 freshwaters are restored from mountains to sea. So this is a project we started with Fonterra, and Fonterra needed some social licence. We've, we started off as a traditional project of planting riparians and we've moved it into a social movement of how farmers address the decline in water, how they stop nitrogen, how they actually work on riparians and how they bring the biodiversity and streams back. So Fonterra has announced another 50 with Vicky uh, Robertson's work on uh, ecos freshwater ecosystems at risk. We are trying to do this together and we will, with the new money we're doing, we will have something like 25 ecosystems where we're doing uh, significant restoration work. 
In Nunga white bait, two of those species are threatened and we cannot continue to eat and sell that species at the rate we are. Um, now, this has been part of our heritage uh, of, of kiwis, of growing up and having a feed of white bait. It's become a highly commercial species. It's worth over $100 a kilo. We're going to have to make some changes to that. Uh, we're going to have to work out how we bring back giant kokopo in places like the Manuhira Kia. The Manuhira Kia was one of those, near Alexandra, is one of those ancient landscapes that didn't drop below the ocean where these species survived. And when the farmers came here, there were so many moa bones, they were using moa bones as, as, as to, to light fires. So it was, it was an incredible place. If you, if you think of St. Bathans had our, our only crocodile. So, so this is sort of these ancient landscapes of little pockets of New Zealand. We've got a thousand huts across New Zealand, many from the days of internal affairs and forest service when we were trying to kill deer. And we've got these gorgeous little places and we're working now with communities where the Outdoor Recreation Consortium is... They are fixing... And, and a lot of these huts are, are 60 years old. They are doing these huts up for about $6,000 a hut. And it's so much better working with a community than us um, you know, hopping in helicopters and doing it. These are doing it as a holiday job, going in and, and hut by hut, fixing huts. Pio Pio Tahi, Milford Sound, going through a million. Uh, there's Aoraki with just, we've got a, that's a camper van park and a, and a, uh, a campsite. It's absolutely chaotic. And of course, as we, as we start to manage that, we're going to put pressure on all those Mackenzie landscapes. And I was in Twizel last week where we had a, a public meeting about the loss of landscapes, freshwater issues and dairy farming, the number one issue was tourism. You know, one night, 20th of January this year, there were 7,000 camper vans camped at various places um, in the Mackenzie Basin. So, you know, and, and of course, Queenstown Lakes District Council has tightened up in camper vans and that's pushed into the Mackenzie. So we're not thinking strategically across the country. We've got a 130 million marketing machine bringing New, uh, New Zealand uh, international people in, and we've got a 140 million machine uh, like Doc looking after them, and we've got a tiny policy unit in MB deciding what we do. So we've got to change that, and uh, fortunately this government is coming to, you know, and, and powering up that whole uh, where we go. 90% of New Zealanders, we want to connect with conservation because it's, it's, it's their land. Healthy nature, healthy people. We know there are significant benefits for obesity, for uh, mental health, uh, for health of people uh, recreating in our natural environments. We're doing a $10 million partnership with Ministry of Health, getting some of the most underprivileged communities in New Zealand out into nature because we know the recovery in nature is quicker. We know it has healing effects. We want people. We've got 200,000 volunteers. We want them nurtured. We want them valued. We want education programs because we need to create the next group of people that are prepared to go out and kill a rat, a stoat, a possum, or take out Darwin's Barbary or, or a wilding pine. Um, the stories, so, so because you know, the stories are very much part, stories of nature are very much part who we are. So, so we've, we've, with Ministry of Arts, Culture and Heritage, we've branded Tohu Whenua, which is the stories that will tell the, the, the birth of a nation, be it the Tangawai disaster, be it at Russell, the, the first par site there, uh, these are stories that are so important, they're part of our DNA, and we want, as Kiwis, to experience these stories uh, as we go through, the, this, uh, and through this landscape, and we want tourists to come and see it. And lastly, a nationwide, net, a, a nationwide network of marine protected areas in place representing our marine ecosystems. We've been missing a bit on marine policy. We've been struggling how we do the Kermadex Ocean Sanctuary. I was part of the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area, the largest marine protected area ever created on the planet. Uh, and, and there the issues were how do we get Russia and China in? Uh, and there was constant... Uh, dialogue with Russia and China until we got that breakthrough. And I think with the Kermit Acts, it, it's really how do we work with our treaty partner on a bigger vision of what we're doing in our oceans. I was in, uh, in uh, the Melbourne Sounds last week. The water temperature had got to 19.5 degrees. Within 10 years, King Salmon will not be able to operate in those sounds. So we have to work out how we shift our whole aquaculture industry out into deep ocean because the sounds are now too warm. 
Uh, so these are huge challenges that we're going to have to face really, really quickly, but we're going to have to do an environment where we're protecting what we value the most. The poor nights on the left, 40,000 people visit that. Uh, that is the, one of the most stunning marine reserves on, on the, in the world. And the humpback whales, in 1964, the Soviet Union and uh, uh, Japan went into the Ross Sea and virtually exterminated New Zealand's um, humpback whale population. And that was the year the whaling station closed in, in, in uh, Torrey Channel. Those whales are coming back. We now know through science that there's a big channel. They go through the Pacific Islands, they, they exchange whale songs at the Kermadex, and then they fan out as they come down the coast and they go as far south as Chile before they come back up the New Zealand coast. We're getting a recovery of about 10 to 15% a year. So, but Korea and China and Norway are inventing these big, cruel vacuum ships which are going to impact the, the way the whales are going to Antarctica in the first place. So hopefully that gives you what we're trying to do and why it's important we get challenged by you and uh, you can see why it's so important we work with our treaty partner on one of the biggest challenges New Zealand faces. If we can do this, it's a whole new country we're talking about with a brand of wine and meat and you know that, that should have a premium and that's what we haven't quite broken through to how we're going to do that. Cure it.